I just want to thank everyone for being part of this uh, webinar series again. Um, it's kind of been a mission of mine to try to, uh, with a lot of new breeders. Hold on. It's, it just said that my internet connection is unstable. Did that miss, Jeremy? You you broke up a little bit on me, but I, but I have you. I have you good right now. You guys all have me well. Yeah, okay. we can hear you fine, Jeremy. Great, great. Well, you should have hit record before the prayer. I'm humbled uh, by the prayer, and that's that's a good thing and and reminds me to remind you that when we're talking about cattle evaluation, right, you're talking about one man's opinion on on a given day. And photograph. It's just that, right? If I go out and take 50 pictures of a bull calf, good or bad, I can find good ones and bad ones. And so, you, you know, when you take evaluations from photographs, take it with a grain of salt. Uh, videos are better than photographs. We can't use those on a webinar, but. Videos allow you to allow you to see three dimensions better than just two dimensions. Um, and so, you know, take it all with a grain of salt. The other piece of it is as producers, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm a judge of livestock. I do a lot of consulting, have traveled uh, extensively um, looking at cattle of, of all breeds. But if you're an observant manager of cattle on your operation, you're going to know more about your cows than I'm ever going to know. I can come in and do a on the hoof evaluation, um, but performance is paramount. And so on the hoof sets us up, um, and that's what we're talking about, right? With bulls, there's a lot at risk. If I go ahead and castrate it and finish it as a steer, I stand to make two to three thousand dollars as a grass-fed beef producer off that animal. If I leave him as a bull and he doesn't turn out to be a bull, uh, I certainly cut into that margin uh, significantly. Uh, and I create management problems for myself. So being able to make that decision as quickly as possible uh, is wonderful, um, but it's, uh, it, it's, it's not an exact science and certainly not so if you're judging off of, uh, of photographs. But, point I want to make is, uh, you know, never go out and castrate something because somebody doesn't like a picture of it, no matter how good of a cowman they are or aren't. What we're going to attempt to do today is, is uh, talk about how we look at bull calves and decide who's going to be uh, a herd bull, who should be kept as a bull and who should be cut. And I run the Lakota bull test for 12 plus years and, and manage Lakota ranch. And again, do consulting and whatnot. Look at a lot of bulls of my own, look at a lot of bulls from other people's uh, to talk about what, you know, would make a good herd sire. We're looking at King Henry, uh, one of our most um, prevalent herd bulls here at Lakota ranch as a seven month old bull and as a mature bull. Uh, and he was a bull that stood out as a bull calf. And the great ones tend to stand out as bull calves. Um, you know, now what does that mean? Obviously, that's all uh, kind of determining on, on the quality of the overall herd, et cetera. And we'll get into that. But that's what we're going to try to get into. AJ and Steve are going to help me moderate. I'm very uh, uh, computer unsavvy. So I can't even see your questions. They're going to kind of field your questions to me as we go and uh, try to keep me reined in. I'm very excited to do this. This is a brand new project that I threw together over the last couple of weeks. Um, we're going to talk a lot about confirmation and look at a lot of pictures of confirmation that apply not just to bulls, but to females and steers as well. If you're raising a steer and he's going to be butchered in two years, who cares if he has bad feet? That's certainly uh, a, a, an accurate statement. But when we're talking about breeding stock, uh, we're talking about cows that last 10, 20 plus years, uh, having good feet, teeth, hair coat, fertility, et cetera, is all very relevant and prominent. And uh, 
the Devon breed has been around uh, over 400 years in this country and, and on record for over 700 years and, and uh, has a lot of history and legacy with it. And the cattle are less changed than most of your modern breeds. And as caretakers of this breed, stewards of this breed, I hope that we can continue on uh, what those before us have, have set in place. So I will uh, get started. This slide and many of these slides that are uh, to be a teaching experience, but it's also meant to be a reference item, something that you can uh, go back to the RDUSA website and look at the slides and, and have something to uh, refer to. Basic confirmation terms, the experienced cattlemen in the group will get this. Those that are new have this to go back to and uh, take a look. You know, we're certainly gonna be talking about different pieces, but I will define them as we go. So we won't waste a whole lot of time here. Um, let me move this, sorry. I think that moves that out of your guy's way. Hey, hey Jeremy, how, um, how old is your bull in that last picture, King Henry? So there was a, a, a picture here of him at seven months. This picture here of him is at, I think, three and a half, maybe four years of age. He was at North American Breeders, which is a um, collection facility where you can do CSS collection, which is to export bulls overseas. And they had a professional photographer that went in and took that picture uh, of him at that point. Thank you. Um, so again, confirmation terms. Um, and, and, and let's get right into it. And, and I'm going to be mean, you know, but before I look at a bull calf, got to look at its mother. No sons of any cows with conformational defects should be kept as bulls. If they've got bad disposition, bad udder, bad hair coat, feet or legs, any kind of structural problem, we can't take the chance on it. And, and down here, I, I hope you guys can see my cursor. There's three to four years of uncertainty. And what I mean by that is when a bull calf is born, he's at least two years old before you put him in production. And, and then it's a year more before you have calves on the ground. And then it's a year after that before you know what those calves really are. You know, if, if you have daughters out of a bull, it's four years after he's born before the first daughter has an udder and is raising a calf. And if all the daughters are going to have bad udders, uh, you're now at least two years into your breeding season. You've bred the cows back to that bull a second time and you've cost yourself two calf crops. We can't risk doing that. And nothing is certain when you're talking about cattle, that's one of the, the, the real heartbreakers, but it's also one of the great things about it. Just like in horse racing, you can produce a sea biscuit from moderate stock and, and put your name on the breed and have an impact uh, across the world. But it, it, you know, when you start with cows with a bad udder, cows with a bad feet, um, you're setting yourself up for failure and, and you just shouldn't do it. Um, way too many cows are kept out of, of or, or I'm sorry, way too many bull calves are kept out of cows with a bad udder. If we're breeding heifers, if we're talking about keeping females, we can talk, we can risk with one animal trying to improve through breeding. Meaning if a cow, you know, has this udder down here, if cow has this udder down here, I, I, I you know, I don't know why you're, you're keeping her for breeding stock, right? If she raises a great, you know, calf every year that grows well, finishes in 24 months and grades choice, absolutely keep her. But why you would ever think of keeping a replacement animal out of her, I don't know. You know, here we're starting to get into the marginal area. Here we're getting into the acceptable area. Um, but a cows with a bad udder, any bull calf that's born out of them can't be kept. If a female out of a cow with a bad udder uh, is kept, 
in two years, you're going to know whether her utter, whether she inherited that bad udder gene or she didn't. But with a bull, you're going to find out times 20, times 30, times 40, times 50. Uh, and that's too big of a risk, in my opinion. If you look at the economics of it, you're better off to buy a proven bull from another producer. Um, biggest problem in our breed. I see bull calves all the time. Uh, when I'm consulting, people say, what about this bull calf? Great. And we go look at mama and she has a bad udder. And the, the conversation's over as far as I'm concerned. So my recommendation is save yourself from yourself. If a cow is, if a bull calf is born from a cow with a bad udder, with bad feet, if a bull calf is born and it's got a big white spot on the side of it, don't wait till it's weaning age and send me a picture and ask me what I think. Cut it. Uh, it doesn't meet the breed standards. It's not confirmationally correct. That stuff is all heritable and unacceptable if you're going to call yourself a seed stock producer and sell stock to other people. So uh, I know I'm being mean, but save yourself from yourself. I don't care what the pedigree is. I get people that call me and say, hey, Jeremy, this calf was just born out of King Henry. He's my next herd sire. Wrong. He's a day old. He's not your next herd sire. He's, he's the prospect. Fair enough. But, but don't put the cart in front of the horse. Um, and certainly if there's confirmational problems or they don't meet the breed standards, uh, you need to cut them and, and move on. And we can talk about why. That's a whole different conversation. I don't care how good they look. I don't care what your market is. Right now, east of the Mississippi, you Devon bulls are in high demand. Commercial producers have discovered that they can have a bull that will produce high quality calves and high quality meat and doesn't try to kill them when they walk in the paddock. It's a much more manageable animal. Um, and so Devon bulls are, are in high demand, but that should not, sorry, that should not make you sacrifice your standards. Bulls out of cows with conformational defects, out of bulls with conformational defects for that matter, should not be kept. So let's, excuse me, let's talk about <coughs> what bulls, <coughs> which calves we should leave at bulls. Sorry. Obviously, we're looking at phenotype. What are, what's the shape of the bull? What does he look like? In grass, we think that small, stocky, deep-bodied animals with lots of capacity are the right type for grass, and that's definitely true to the most degree. Um, obviously we want to look at performance data and other things to verify that, but it's a great place to start. Pedigree, proven producers uh, certainly come through most of the time. If I've got a 10 year old cow that's produced great, now her milk's gone down a little bit. I know the genetic package is still, still there. So I'll rely on that pedigree. And when I'm evaluating calves, I'll add a little bit to that animal based on quality of pedigree uh, on, on both sides. Um, and again, that's, that's the same thing here as performance history of the dam and sire. Uh, and that's also age and milk of the dam. Again, a 15 year old cow is, uh, is gonna produce less milk, um, you know, certainly than a, than a, uh, uh, a five year old cow. Um, sorry, I'm trying to turn off my cell phone right here. Um, horned versus polled, polled bulls sell for more money and are more in demand than horned. Doesn't mean you shouldn't keep a horned bull here at Lakota. If they're born with horns for the last four or five years, we cut them. We create far too many high quality polled bulls, uh, which is what the market really is looking for. Um, so we don't see the need to keep, uh, the horned bulls. Purebred versus crossbred. Uh, so the standards can lower a little bit, right? If I'm breeding bulls and I'm going to sell them to somebody to crossbreed over some Angus cows or some Hereford cows, uh, genetics are going to work in my favor. Heterosis is going to help me. And those bad genes are far less likely to come to the surface. So 
I still wouldn't keep a bull out of a cow with a bad udder or bad feet. Um, but a bull out of a cow with marginal udder used in a crossbred situation should work very well. If you are a producer of purebred cattle, I would encourage you to not register that animal um, when you sell it to that crossbred producer so that it doesn't get resold and put back into the gene pool. Again, as stewards of the breed, um, we should strive to improve the breed. Um, yes, we need to make money and stay in business, uh, but hopefully not at the expense of the quality of the cattle. Uh, birth weight is certainly uh, 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 something that should be talked about. Um, there are variations in different operations. Um, several prominent breeders in this breed, um, uh, those out in the Midwest in, in the Iowa, Wisconsin area, and those up in, in, in upper New York uh, have high quality grass, high quality hay. And typically when I go up there and inspect their cattle, um, they're, they're in, in far better condition than my cattle. Um, and if anything, they have a problem not getting the cattle too fat and experience higher birth weight. So there are variations based on the body condition score and the nutrition that you give to your cattle. The breed average though is 74 pounds and, uh, you know, 90 pounds is too big. Um, high eighties, um, is certainly questionable. I, I would have to see what the cow looks like in the bull that I was out of and what the operation was, but, um, certainly large calves again is heritable, not something that we want to pass on gestation length should certainly be considered. Um, you know, in some of the other countries where they raise Devons, they're tracking gestation length far closer than what we are. And what they found is, you know, the average gestation on a cow is 283 days and Devon's come in around 278 days. It's not a huge deal, five days. But if you talk about a cow that lasts 15, 20 years and you talk about having a hundred of them and you gain five days a year, um, it becomes a pretty significant number just in terms of pounds of beef produced, uh, which is the business that we're in, right? Um, Testicular correctness. This is the other thing. Um, James Drayson's book, sorry. This is why they don't let me work on the computer. I apologize there. Let me get back to where we were. James Drayson's book, sorry, um, Herd Bull Fertility. If you don't have it and you, again, are considering yourself a seed stock producer, you're selling breeding stock to other people, you need to have this book. Um, be careful where you read it because people will think you're some kind of weirdo because um, it's mostly pictures of incorrect testicles. Um, but what James Drayson and many others have figured out is the size, the shape, the circumference, the correctness of testicles is of the utmost importance. And I can tell you, uh, in a lifetime of breeding cattle, the best bulls that we've had here at Lakota Ranch and Effingham Plantation were bulls with massive testicles. Uh, they're the bulls that have stood the test of time, uh, have lasted and, and been the top producers. Um, we're talking about length of testicle. We're talking about circumference at the fattest part. And we're talking about having a proper epididymis at the bottom of each testicle uh, for proper function. If any of those are out of place, what are you waiting for? And bull calves, heifer calves, when they're born, they hit the ground. You need to inspect testicles. You need to inspect the udder. You know, there is no udder on a newborn calf. I get it, but I can look at teat spacing. I can make sure there's four teats, not three or five. Um, there's a lot that can be assessed. Even shape of the, te of, of the, the uh, teats can be assessed at that age and um, deformities in the testicles can certainly be assessed at that point and you can save yourself a lot of time. Um, so let's, let's jump forward. I know I've been on the soapbox a lot there, but uh, again, um, 
I get a lot of pictures of bull prospects and most of them should have been cut. Um, most producers of purebred cattle should cut everything for the first couple of years. In my opinion, get to learn your trade before you offer something for sale, because if you put bad stuff out on the market, you're hurting the breed, you're hurting your reputation and your ability to do business, uh, for, for decades to come. So let's assume that the, the, the sire and the dam are correct. There's no uh, noticeable conformational defects. They both have solid production records and the testicles on the bull calf are acceptable. What else, do we, what are we looking for the next hundred days? And the first thing I'm looking for, is he a bull? You know, from a distance, sometimes it's a little bit easier to tell than when you're up in the pen on them. But some bull calves, you're out in the pasture, you're checking the cows, and he's standing, you know, 30, 40 yards away. And you man, look at that little bull calf. Look at the muscling. Look at the masculinity. You know, we're looking at a couple of, 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 of bull prospects here um, from Lamp Post and Four Seasons Farm. Um, both these calves are clearly bulls. Uh, they're masculine. If they're not bulls uh, and they're heifers, they need to be put into the meat program because they're exhibiting tons of testosterone. Um, this is what, what we're looking for uh, in a young calf. Um, some minimum performance requirements at 100 days. I want to see 200 pounds. Got to wean at 450 pounds. Some people are weaning at 650 pounds. Some people are weaning at 350 pounds. If you're weaning at 350 pounds, whether you're doing it on grass or grain, um, you need to rethink your management because you're not hitting minimum requirements. And um, <clears throat> we all want to be grass fed and natural, but not at the expense of the welfare of the animal. Sorry. Trying to go fast here. We did a dry run last night and I went over the hour uh, by quite a bit. So trying to move quickly, but I want an animal that weans. It needs to wean at least at 450 pounds <clears throat> and I need a scrotal circumference, circumference rather at, of 27 centimeters at 100 days. Um, I'm not measuring scrotal circumference at 100 days. I'm not going to pretend to do that. I can look at them, but what I'm getting at is at a year of age, I need to have 30 centimeters. And at two years of age, I need to have 34 centimeters. And that again, is a minimum requirement. Um, all these numbers I'm giving you are not the industry numbers. Industry numbers are way above what I'm giving you. I'm giving you grass production numbers, um, not just for Devons, for all breeds, but doing it on grass is very different than grain. And it affects hip height, frame score, scrotal circumference, weaning weight, nearling weight, et cetera. Certainly factor in the, the, the age of the dam and how much milk she's putting uh, in, into uh, weaning weight, et cetera. Um, I'm looking for balance in my calf. Um, I, I, I really don't like outliers. Um, I wanna see balanced animals that I can say, ah, there's nothing wrong with that bull at all. He, you know, maybe he doesn't blow me off out of the water, but I can't find anything wrong with them. Those are the type that I want to keep as bulls. Obviously the ones that blow me out of the water are, are staying bull calves too. Um, but as long as I can't find significant problems with them, they're well balanced. That's great disposition. We have the quietest breed out there. Um, you know, again, uh, almost uh, a thousand years of selection for disposition. And if you're going to be the guy that decides to keep a crazy bull and put him back into the gene pool, shame on you. Um, but anything with a bad disposition, again, no matter how good it looks, needs to be removed. And in my opinion, it's a whole lot easier to get it off the property at 250 pounds than uh, 750 pounds. Um, and how do they move? You know, let's talk about tracking. We're going to get into feet and legs and shoulder rotation and hip slope and a lot of things here. But at the end of the day, if an animal tracks, it's confirmationally probably okay. And what tracking means is when it's walking at the front foot, leaves a spot, the back foot on the same side should take that spot. And if that's happening, 
it's probably not too severely post-legged or sickle hocked or, or, or uh, steep shouldered. Um, shoulder rotation, right? I want to see the shoulder rotate up to the spine when an animal walks. If it's rotating well below that, it's probably a peak at animal. It's probably narrow um, at his shoulder. And, and you're not going to have that loin development that we want. So, you know, we want some broadness there. Certainly in our bulls, we want more broadness in the shoulder than we do in our females. But I don't want any of them to be peaked at the shoulder and the set of the feet and the legs. You know, again, when they track, do they track wide or do they track narrow? When they stand, do they stand wide or do they stand narrow? Animals with lots of muscle and capacity are going to stand wider. Hundred to 205 days. Um, I'm going to look at the sheath, the brisket, the dewlap, right? So what I'm talking about is I'm talking about the leather underneath here. This bull has a nice tidy sheath. Um, I think this bull comes from Oklahoma Farms up in Canada. He's got a nice tidy sheath here, which I like. He's carrying a little extra leather here in the brisket dewlap area, right? And, uh, but not an excessive amount. Um, this I would consider very accessible, uh, uh, acceptable, but uh, uh, you know, significant amount more than this would be unacceptable. And we'll get into some sheath evaluation as we continue to go forward. Um, 205 days is the industry average when we wean calves. Most of us that are doing it on grass are weaning calves at, at an older age than 205 days, but we can still get a weight close to that 205 days and 450 pounds is pretty modest. Um, he'd have to be a heck of a bull for me to keep him at 450 pounds at 205 days. Um, scrotal circumference of 28 is also pretty modest. You know, if I'm, if I'm looking at this bull, I'm going, I don't know if he's going to make that 34 by two years of age and he better be exceptional in every other area uh, for me to take him. So again, these are minimums. And we're going to start to do our bone structure and confirmation evaluation. You know, when you're looking at calves, a lot of stuff is hard to, uh, to pinpoint for sure. You have areas of concern. You have areas that you really like. But once we pass this 100 days and move to the 205 days, we can start to see, is the animal fine boned or is he heavy boned? You know, does he have that nice cannon bone shape like your wrist or does he have big round, wide, dense bones? Um, does he have a lot of extra leather? Um, you know, is that a big sheath or is that a prolapsed umbilicus? These things start to work out. Um, so we can start to do that evaluation, which again, we're going to get into more here in the next few slides. And I appeal, you know, we've done the bull test here for over 10 years and I can have two bulls standing next to each other. And this one's got the best pedigree and performance data and ultrasound and, on paper, he's great, but this bull over here with very modest data has a lot of pop and eye appeal, and this bull is going to outsell this bull every time. Doesn't make it correct. Um, production will determine which is the better bull, um, but eye appeal is certainly a, uh, a, a, a another factor that has to be considered when you're talking about uh, um, seed stock production. Chasing females, you know, when I go out in the, in the herd and everybody's calved out and we're 40, 50 days from the beginning of the calving season and those early calving cows are starting to come in heat, um, the bulls with heavy testosterone and maturity are going to be the ones chasing that cow around, right? We haven't put the bull out yet, or maybe we have, it doesn't matter, but those bull prospects, the ones that we want to really keep our eye on are the ones that are following those cows in heat and uh, uh, exhibiting that testosterone. Crest development, you know, in a young bull, once we start to see this crest developing, uh, again, that's a, a great sign of testosterone. And we need to start to see that, um, you know, the end game is two years. We produce steers in the grass-fed market that are designed to finish in two years. So we need bulls and cows that are fully mature at two years of age. 
So it, I need to see some crest development, some masculinity really starting to show itself. I showed those pictures earlier of the bull calves that had that masculinity right out of the gate. Not every herd bull is going to have that. But if we're at 205 days and I still can't say, man, look at that little bull, look at the muscling on that guy. Uh, he needs to be cut before you go any further. We're going to reevaluate testicular development. Um, hair, hair on the scrotum is going to be prevalent in bulls before they hit puberty. Um, you know, we don't want to see a lot of hair on an udder. We don't want to see a lot of hair on testicles in animals in general, but up to about 10 months of age, it's okay. Once they pass that point, that hair should fall off. Um, it should take on more of a buckskin appearance. Obviously, we want that football shape. Um, when, we're, when we're measuring the testicles, we also want to assess tone. You know, it should be firm like muscle tissue, not, not soft and squishy like fat. And obviously, the size and length of the testicles is also very important. So what I've done here is we're going to go through different body parts of the animal. And I put up a paragraph. Um, a lot of this is more for reference for you to go back uh, to evaluate. So I'll, I'll kind of rip through these and then we'll get to the slides and spend most of our time there. Um, but when I'm evaluating confirmation and phenotype, um, I, I, I have a, a selection criteria checklist. Mine's in my head. Some people it would be better maybe to put it on paper. But what we're looking for is balance and overall quality. Um, I like to start at the feet and the legs. I want a sound, solid foot. I want toes that are even in size and don't overlap and don't have a lot of gap between them. I want a heel being deep and a pastern angle of 45 degrees or close to it. Any rolling of the hoof, overgrown feet that have to be trimmed in a bull calf, in a bull of any age, is undesirable. But in a bull calf, it's totally unacceptable um, and he should not be kept. So pastor and angle, um, and I'm going to go through this stuff at, at, at a pretty fast pace. But again, we're recording this so you can come back to it. You know, this calf is very straight up on his hoof, right? All his weights up on the front of his hooves. This calf uh, back here, you know, has a pretty severe angle here. So all his weights on the back of his hoof. Some people might say he has a shallow hoof angle instead of saying he has a bad pastern angle. And it's really the same thing. What we're talking about is in a proper 45 degree angle of the pastern from here to here, right? I, I want 45 degrees and that's going to evenly distribute the weight of this animal on all four feet on all eight toes. And, and in the Devon breed, we have cows that last 20 years, bulls that last well into their teens. They're not going to make it there if they have bad feet. So pastern and angle is, is certainly important. Uh, this is another slide here showing the same thing, you know, too much angle, um, too straight up on his toes and the ideal angle. We're going to get into shoulder angle uh, in a little bit but this is another slide that shows it well. I want this shoulder bone out in front of the foot, not straight above the foot. Uh, but all this adds to longevity uh, and adds to the animal holding up over time. Feet the same way, overgrown toes, big gaps between toes. Uh, none of this is acceptable. When you look at an animal here and just in this illustration with the overgrown foot, it tends to make them walk more on their heel and their foot wear out. Um, regardless, it's going to break the foot down and cows aren't that different from people, right? If you sprain your ankle, you start limping around, then your knee on the other side or your hip starts hurting and everything gets thrown out of whack. So, you know, anything as simple as an overgrown toe um, can actually put a cow down and, 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 and kill a cow if not taken care of. And depending on your production system, uh, taking care of a cow with a bad foot can be easy or hard, but nobody wants to do it. Here's just an actual photograph of a, a bull prospect with bad feet. Um, legs and feet work together, right? There's got to be a smooth transition of this animal. Balance is something that we're going to hit on. Bulls need to have a bold, pronounced shoulder. I want to see, again, that masculinity is expressed in a crest and broad shoulders, a big wide chest. 
but I need the shoulder to blend into the chest. You can't be hollow behind the shoulder. I need to have a smooth transition from the front of the animal all the way to the back on a wide chest floor and front legs that have appropriate width. Again, when that animal tracks, you know, are we wide or are we narrow? That's very uh, relevant to the, to the capacity and the muscling of the bull. The bull skeletal structure should be balanced and should distribute the weight evenly on all four legs, all eight toes. And we have to examine the legs from the front, the side, uh, the back, and we need to see an animal move. If you see an animal standing there and he's pigeon toed, you know, make him walk around and reset his feet and see if he's still pigeon toed at that point. So, you know, from feet, we move to legs, right? Obviously, uh, this is correct. Bow-legged is we're bowed out here in the back and cow-hocked is turned in this way. They call it cow-hocked for a reason, right? Most cows are a little bit cow-hocked. 10% is considered fine. And I would tell you even 15 to 20% is probably reasonable. But an animal that's severely cow-hocked, again, is not going to distribute its weight evenly on all four feet and all eight toes when it walks. Neither is an animal that's considerably bow-legged. Um, so we need an animal, ideally all four feet to point forward, all four knees to point forward. Um, and the set of the legs from the side is the same. You know, correct is a little bit of a sickle hock, a little bit of a bend here uh, where the feet are getting up under the hip. You know, too straight has these feet towards the back. That's going to make the weight up on the toes and too far up underneath of the animal is going to create weight on the back of the heel and a sickle hock and the animal's not going to last as, as long. If I had to pick, I would rather have an animal a little more sickle hock than a little more post-legged. Post-legged inhibits movement. And when we're talking about bulls, a post-legged bull like this guy down here, um, you've got to question his ability to get up on the cow and breed a cow. And again, he's got to do it, you know, 50, 100 times a season for multiple generations. So when we talk about this here, um, you know, in a post-legged animal, this, this hip bone is almost directly above the feet, you know, in a, in a, in a, a sickle hocked animal is a whole lot more bend to it. You know, and what we would like to have is, is the stifle and, the, and then the hock and the pastern in line. So uh, again, with legs, you know, we want the, a, a, a knock kneed animal, you know, is one that's, that's uh, you know, knees are pointed in. Um, you can see down here, knock kneed and bow legged, splay footed pigeon toed right either way we're talking about turning out or turning in we want four feet that point forward you know this animal you know here is not only splay footed but you know there's considerable gap between his toes here he's already overgrown a little bit you know a lot not to like in the set of the feet and legs of this animal if this is a steer that you're finishing in two years who cares his feet aren't going to break down in two years probably not going to break down in five years but with a breeding animal that we want to last 10 years or more, it's pretty significant. Buck need versus calf need. Again, we, want, we, we, we don't want the, the knees to bow out or bow in. Um, we want the structure to be the right, correct. Um, what I tell a lot of people is if, if you don't know how a cow should walk or how their feet should be, go look at a large group of cows. You know, it's the one that's walking different from everybody else. Uh, it's the one that stands different chronically from everybody else that's the one that you need to figure out what's wrong with um, most cows are, are correct in their feet and legs um, but again when we're talking about bull selection you know the margin for error is very small you know when we're talking about feet and legs and and how they work together we also have to talk about how those legs work with the shoulders and the hips um, there's a stifle joint in cows and a lot of people think the stifle joint is the hip joint it's not this is the hip joint. This is the stifle joint. The stifle joint's more like a knee, actually, than it is like a hip. Um, and I only say this for reference. You know, when a cow slips and falls, this, the, the, when they injure, the stifle joint is usually when a cow goes down. How all these things work together 
is obviously of paramount importance. So understanding the anatomy of the animal will give you a better understanding of it when you're judging the animal. We're talking about balance, longevity, and performance. Um, and the, 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 the angle of these uh, is all important. Again, shoulder and rump slope are equally important. And we're going to get to those in, in subsequent slides. So shoulder slope, here we go right now. So, you know, I, we want our bulls to be smooth across the top. I want a lot of width between these shoulders. Width is good. Um, certainly a lot of width can also be indicative of heavy birth weight. So you gotta be a little bit careful there and make sure that's not the case. As bulls age, you will start to see some dip here, uh, but we shouldn't see it in a young bull. Um, so we want smooth shoulders and then we want a good shoulder angle. Right. I want this shoulder bone to sit out here in front of the feet, not directly above the feet. Shoulder angle is a hard one to assess from a photograph. Right. You really need to see the animal and be close to the animal. Maybe even put your eyes on the animal to assess. Um, you know, this this is 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 bad. This is pretty extreme. Um, and this is 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 really good. You know, it's, it's, it's a really small error, uh, uh, you know, room for error there. You know, this is a bull here. Um, you know, I can see the shoulder bone here to right above the feet. I don't like that. I also really don't like the transition again from the shoulder to the midsection. There's a big hollow spot right here. You know, I want this to be a smooth transition. You know, this, this young bull over here, this uh, Opoma bull again, you know, there's a smooth transition. I can see a shoulder bone out here in front. Now this foot's a little bit forward. So again, I'm looking at a photograph, but it appears to be an appropriate shoulder angle, um, you know, here that I'm looking for. Uh, and I also have a very smooth transition in this bull. This bull's got lovely muscling and he's got a masculine head and he's got good testicles and a tight sheath. There's some good things that I like, but he looks like a Mr. Potato Head, like pieces were put together. And I don't like that. I, I want a smooth transition from front to back uh, on, on all my animals, male and female. Rump slope. You know, rump slope comes into play when we start talking about calving, right? You know, the pelvic angle is, is uh, critical when an animal uh, is calving. And so when we talk about rump slope, we're talking about the hooks and the pins. And, you know, a lot of people when they're out in the field want to look at this area. You know, that's not the pin. That's the widest part, right? But there's, there's, a, there's a bone, you know, the hook and the pins. And, and when you can identify them, and again, it's easier on, a, on an animal in the field, but that's this rump slope we want to be level. You know, here's an animal, hip bones, pin bones, you know, there's a drop there. Again, I'm not coming here, I'm coming here, but there's still a drop here. That pelvic angle is heritable. So is his daughter's gonna have trouble calving um, would be a concern when you have an improper rump slope. Um, you know, this flat rump slope is what we want. Um, uh, a lot of animals, most animals have a little bit of a rump slope um, and a little bit of a rump slope in some people's opinion um, would make calving even easier. Um, but a significant rump slope would be bad. And certainly a rump slope that goes up would be negative. Now this bull here that we're looking at, he actually comes up a little bit in his tail head. And, uh, and that would be indicative of a poor rump slope. But when I look at his hooks and his pins, they're level. So I'm okay with that. Now, when you talk about a high tail head, the, the issue becomes a narrow pelvis, not so necessarily a small pelvis, but a narrow pelvis, which also can, can create dystocia and some calving problems and, and is a heritable trait. So not saying that a high tail head is, is okay if the rump slope is okay, but if the high tail head and the rump slope match each other, you definitely have a problem. Um, ideally, we would like to have them flat across or just a little bit of slope, but certainly not significant slope. And when I'm talking about bulls, I like this picture here. I don't want peaking in my shoulder. I certainly don't want peaking in my rear end. Uh, I, want, I want wide and flat.
as much as I can in the shoulder and in the rope. So after evaluating feet and legs, you know, I'm going straight to the testicles and, and shape, length, and tone again. Uh, testicles are indicators of correctness, fertility, and testosterone. Um, you know, if, I, if I'm having to pick bulls on one trait, which is the worst thing you could do, testicles would probably be the place I would go. It's a, that important. If you're buying bulls, you know, a bull stud, anybody that's, that's uh, selling seed stock, should be able to provide you with a scrotal circumference measurement and a breeding soundness exam, which is, is simply an evaluation of testicles, penis, and semen quality. Um, and uh, in 20 years, I've only had one bull that, that didn't pass a breeding soundness exam and had to be cold because of it. Um, but when you're buying a bull, and if you're talking about trucking them halfway across the country, uh, I would want either a breeding soundness exam or a guarantee that the bull could pass a breeding soundness exam. Um, yearling bulls testicular uh, circumference can be anywhere in this range. Uh, this would be considered uh, on the fringe and this would be considered exceptional. There can be fertile bulls out of this range, but you know, there can be bulls with one testicle that are fertile but you don't want to use them in your herd. And, and if you are, I don't want to buy seed stock from you. Um, uh, a breeding soundness exam can give you also an idea of live semen count, abnorms, and some other things. Don't undervalue the importance of testicles. Um, they are, uh, again, if I could only do one trait, that would be the one that, uh, that I would be doing. After testicles, feet and legs, we've looked at, now I wanna look at width and depth. You know, we're talking about capacity and spring of ribs. I wanna see how much volume this guy has. Um, I'll start from behind. I wanna see a wide base. Again, I wanna see his feet track wide. I wanna see his, his chest and his, and, his, and his back legs set wide because there's muscling. I wanna see this muscle shape in his hind quarter. I wanna see it carry down the hind quarter. I wanna see him be full from behind. If, I, if his tail moves out of the way, you know, how, how far down do the, do the thighs touch each other? You know, can I see the neck of the scrotum or is the neck of the scrotum hidden because the muscles are touching that far down his back leg? Um, that's what I'm looking for in a muscle pattern of a bull. How wide does he track when he's walking? Again, does, does the, the back foot occupy the space, the front foot left? but how wide apart are those legs when he's walking? That's a great way to tell uh, about muscle and capacity. A wide base, heavy muscle bull with a wide loin, wide shoulder and tremendous spring of rib. Spring of rib, we're talking about the middle, the barrel of the animal. Um, not only is his loin big, but is, 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 is his whole midsection, is his capacity big? Is that spring of rib, uh, there and in a bull that it is, it'll have capacity and muscle throughout his entire carcass. Um, two young bulls here, one from from our place here at Lakota, and another one from AJ O'Neill's. Um, you know, you stand behind these guys, and again, I don't even have to see their head to know that they're bulls. They're meat and muscle. You know, this muscle pattern that I'm talking about carries far down the back leg. You know, when we're looking at it from the side, this is where our eye tends to go. But does that, does that meat travel, you know, down the back leg? You know, look at the meat in the tail of these animals. You know, some animals have a rat tail. They have just nothing but bone and skin. You know, a well-muscled animal will actually have some meat and muscle back here in his tail. That's what I'm looking for in a young bull at a young age. Um, that width, that muscling from behind, feet set wide apart, right? Not set narrow, close together. Width, spring of rib and loin. I hate this picture, but it's the only one I can find. The reason I hate it is because in a bull, my shoulders should be wider than my hips. This is what a cow should look like. Hips should be wider than the shoulder here. But what I wanna see is width from front to back in my cows and my bulls. I wanna see good loin development. Uh, and I wanna see it start at the shoulder and carry all the way back in the carcass. Um, you know, here, here, here's a, 
a different view of it, right? But this eye muscle area, this is the this is the highest dollar cut of meat that we're producing. So the wider and more prominent that is, the better. If I can get that animal in a catch and put my hands on it, you can feel it, right? And and uh, the volume of muscle that you have there is very important. This four season bull prospect here, you know, I can see that loin muscle carrying down his back. That's what I'm looking for, right? Spring a rib, volume, meat and muscle, front legs set wide apart. That's what I'm looking for in terms of capacity, right? From a picture, normally we see depth. We see top to bottom. I, I also need to see it across here. From the rear of the bull, we move to the side where we can see moderate body length. Anybody else who's given this pre presentation is telling you they want to see the length of body. They want to see length and length. I, I don't mind length as long as the animal tracks and is in balance. I'm okay with that. Um, but, but balance is the key word to me, not length. Right. I need to see the animal track. I need to see him in balance. I need to see weight on all four feet. Uh, that's what I'm looking for. I want to see depth to the fore rib and the flank. I want to see a balanced, deep sided bull with adequate muscle and spring rib. They tend to be better performers. I say adequate muscle because everybody wants meat muscle, meat muscle. You can't breed meat and muscle 10 generations in a row. You have to put some maternal, some milk back in there. And so adequate muscle is where I, where, where I will say that. If your cows need meat and muscle, you should buy a bull with exceptional meat and muscle. If your cows have plenty of meat and muscle, you might want to consider putting some maternal back into them. There's different bulls in, within the breed um, that'll go extreme one way or another, or will lean gently one way or another. Um, side view of the animal allows us to see how he ties in behind the shoulder like we looked at with the other bulls his muscle pattern you know does he have that round bubble butt or does he have a more square muscle pattern does it carry down the leg or is it all just high up on the leg um, his overall balance and correctness aligns does he have that straight top line or is he sag in the middle or you know or does he come up in the tail head um, we can see all this from the side I want to see a wedge-shaped, straight-top bull with a long level hip and a strong rear leg. He should be wedge-shaped and absolutely masculine. You know, this is a Kit Farrow slide here that I stole, and this is what we're looking for. Again, in our cows, I want a wedge shape going this way, and from the top, it should do the same thing. Wider here and a little more narrow here, and my bull wider here more narrow here and from the top wider from shoulder to shoulder and more narrow here doesn't mean i want my bull narrow in the back or my cows narrow in the front but wedge-shaped animals going back to jan bondsma and and, and many other cowmen uh, have, have better proven performance longevity uh, than those with a, a square boxy look to them right? I want a bull that's, that's, that's larger in the front and goes back. He can't be pencil gutted, um, but he should be wedge shaped. You know, here's two bulls. Here's again, a bull that transitions horribly from the, from the shoulder back. He sags here in the middle. Um, he's got a good heavy muscled rump and good masculinity here and decent hair coat, good, good, uh, nice fine bone structure not what we're looking for right I want that smooth transition I want big spring of rib I want lots of capacity but he's not Mr. Potato Head he wasn't a bunch of pieces stuck together you know this rump doesn't fit this front end you know this bull is smooth transition from front to back um, got good length of body here looks a little short maybe in his neck but his head's turned towards us um, but generally speaking, I see a well-balanced bull with lots of volume and capacity, very clean lines, nice straight top line, good rump angle. Um, maybe his shoulder angle is a little hard to assess here. Um, that's something maybe I'd want to look at a little bit more, but like everything I see in that picture. Um, underline of the bull we just talked about, right, should be clean with a tight sheath that is tight to the body, not distended, doesn't hang down. Same applies to that brisket and dewlap area. 
the throat and the brisket need to need to be masculine, right? Need to be, I want my bulls not to look like NFL players. I want them to look like truck drivers, you know, big, meaty, muscular, fat uh, um, animals, um, but neat, not wasty. Um, uh, it's much more important in rough terrain. Uh, I think AJ told me and Enrique Garcia down in Texas is on with us. You know, he's down there with cactus and, and all kinds of wild stuff in Texas and a bull that's got a lot of stuff, leather hanging down uh, a dangly sheath is going to collect that stuff. And it's going to cut into production. It's going to cut into longevity. It's going to make management more tougher. Um, so depending on your terrain, you need to be, more aware or less aware of that but if you're planning again to produce seed stock to sell across the country you need to be aware of it in all your prospects um here's a couple bulls that we'll look at here's a, a bull calf you know maybe 90 100 days old but just lots of leather everywhere lots of leather in this brisket area lots of sheath here there's a back leg here makes it hard to look but this sheath goes you know is a couple inches wide and deep you know, when I'm looking at a sheath, I want to make sure I'm not looking at hair right down here. Is this hair down here? Or is this sheath down here? I think this is hair and this is sheath, you know, but this is all sheath. A lot of wastiness here. A lot of extra leather here would make me really careful about keeping this bull. This bull here, not as bad in the sheath, but even worse up here in this in this dewlap throat area. Um, I'd be real worried about that. This bull also is lacking a little bit of masculinity here would make me a little bit concerned. Um, you know, and as these things add up, it's more reason to cut one. Here's the Oklahoma bull we looked at earlier that has some extra leather. And I wanted to put him in there again, because again, you know, how much is too much? I don't consider this bad. This is much more important than this area. Um, uh, you know, but all are important. And just, again, what's the overall look of the bull? You know, this bull's tight and clean, the rest of the bull. These two guys have a lot of leather everywhere. I want to point out, this is a newborn calf, and, and his sheath area is really large. But when it's a sheath area in a newborn calf, we don't know if that's a herniated umbilicus, meaning his umbilical cord um, got swollen and gorged with blood. And, and that'll go away, right? So don't castrate a bull because you see this unless it's still there 100 days later. Uh, when weight is evenly distributed uh, on all the feet, he should move easily and freely. He should have a balanced, fluent stride without restriction. Again, watch all the cows walk. Does he walk the same as everybody else? Or does one hip swing, swing out to the side or do his feet point in when he walks? You know, those would be obvious indications of a, of an, of a problem, a structural defect that is probably going to be heritable. Maybe he's had an injury, but if you don't know, you can't take that risk. When he walks, he should track and he should track wide. Shoulders should rotate in line with the spine or very close to it. Certainly don't want him to rotate way above the spine or, or way below. Um, everything needs to move fluid without a hitch or a swing. Head of the neck needs to be masculine and covered in curse, coarse curly hair. You should see ample neck muscling. We talked about crest and a balanced head and neck carriage. I want to see lots of length and, and meat and muscle there, but it needs to be in balance with the rest of his body. Uh, it's critical to the balance structure and longevity of the bull. Undesirable for bull prospects to be low headed or high headed, long necked or to carry their head too high. All indications of structural issues. Looking at two Devon bulls here, you know, this is a five, six year old Devon bull, coarse curly hair uh, from the neck, even on the shoulder and the head, extremely masculine. Here's a two year old bull, doesn't have quite the age to him, but already has the coarse curly hair up here, uh, extremely masculine. This is a select sire. There's one of their high end, and he doesn't have a coarse curly hair on him. He's incredibly slick, looks like a racehorse. Um, and his head is held way high above his spine. These bulls' heads are laid right in line with their spine. I don't mind if it comes up some 
but I sure don't want anything like this. Um, again, I want my bulls to look like truck drivers, not, not uh, NBA players. We're looking for balance. When the head's carried in a normal position, it, it, uh, it shows up in other parts of the skeleton and can have, uh, that one's a, is not carried in, sorry, the camera was there. Um, it, it obviously creates problems. Everything's connected, all parts of the body work together. So when one part's off, it affects other parts. We want a bull to look masculine and show signs of breed character. We want him to look like a Devon. We want him to, to look like the breed standard, but the head has to match the rest of the body and everything has to be in balance. Um, this is what we're looking right for, right? Like. I got good lengths of, of rump here. I got, I got my one third. I got my one third. I got my one third. If any part's going to be longer, it's going to be this part by a little bit, but everything looks balanced and smooth transition from front to back. Um, when we're evaluating animals, temperament disposition uh, is easy to assess, right? When we look next, walk up to the bull, does he run off? Do his ears prick? Does his head come up? Are his eyes crazy or are they calm? Um, if his mom's cuckoo, he's probably going to be a little cuckoo. Sometimes you got to separate them to see. But if there's any question of temperament, if you give them a little time to work it out and it doesn't happen, castrate them. No bull should be kept with any kind of questionable disposition because the, the standard in this breed is 10 steps above everybody else and needs to be maintained uh, by everybody. Um, you know, this is unacceptable right now. I, I don't know, maybe they hit him with a hot shot and dogs were after him or whatever. Uh, some bulls have bad days, but uh, a, a, an animal with a bad temper shows it pawing at the ground, their eyes are angry, their head, their ears, etc. Um, body language will tell you everything if you're observant uh, and you pay attention. Year of age, got to be 800 pounds, got to have 30 centimeters scrotal. Again, talking about minimums. Shoulder width needs to be wider than the rump at this point. You know, you're, you're a year old now. Testosterone has to have kicked in if you're an early maturing animal. So I need to see that expressed in a crest development and wide shoulders. I can also start to see what's your, not your final frame score, but I get some pretty good idea. You know, are you going to be a two, a four, or a six? Um, and again, do you maintain breed standards and character? You know, if you were born with a white sheath, I don't know why you were left a bull. It's not going to go away. But as an animal gets older, um, you know, some things become more prevalent and, and other things go away. Like most bull calves are not born with a white switch in their tail. They're born with a red tail. But by a year of age, if they're a purebred Devon bull and they meet the breed standards, they will have a white switch in their tail. So do we have that, the breed standards and character? And again, do we have eye appeal at this point? You know, you're in puberty now. Um, you should start to be showing it. From a year to two years of age, does the bull shed off, right? The first year off mama, you just transition from a milk diet to a grass diet. Um, everything may not be working properly, glandular function, your nutritional needs may not be in met, you might not shed off 100% properly. Uh, by the second year, you need to, if you haven't shed off proper by then, it's a genetic issue uh, or a significant nutritional uh, uh, lack of minerals by your, your manager. But uh, if everything is being provided nutritionally, you should shed off at that point. Increase libido, you're a bull, right? Um, the next one's testosterone versus IMF. If I'm going to visit somebody, I'm going to see uh, Bob Van Kirk there in, in Pennsylvania, and he's got two bulls I'm interested in. One's walking the fence, pawing at the ground, bellering at the other bull across the road, and the other bull's up under a tree laying and just enjoying himself. I have to factor that in. That heavy testosterone bull is going to wear off weight. He's going to have less intermuscular fat. He's going to take longer to finish because testosterone is heavier. The other bull that's laying under the tree is going to have more fat to him. But now I got a question. His, is, does he have the libido? Does he, is he going to get my cow's bread? Um, you know, is fertility there? Um, I want my bulls to be bulls. So I think we all tend towards the heavy testosterone bull. But my point is when we're assessing bulls, 
you have to assess development and ultrasound data uh, and other things based on the amount of testosterone the bull's exhibiting uh, on his age and, and his genetic makeup. Reevaluate for structural correctness. If you did it at a year of age and weaning, that's great, but do it again. Um, finish time. Again, it's a 24-month window. I'm looking for animals that finish in two years or less. If you show me your bull and he's four years old and you say, isn't he great? Well, so what? What did he look like when he was two? That's what I need to know because that's when I'm producing meat in that window. And so animals that take four years to finish, uh, I can't make money on. I can't be profitable. There's too many good ones that do it in two years for me to wait four years. And again, projections, what's he going to be mature weight, um, hip height, frame score, capacity. I'm getting a better idea of what the finished product's going to be. Just another great Devin Bull. I'm behind on time, so we won't take lots of time here. But wow, right? Balanced, heavy, just the way it should be and all done on grass. Other factors you have to consider pedigree for sure. Again, you know, if it's a 12 year old cow and she's done it right 10 times, um, I'd lean in her favor. The producer, know who you're buying your cattle from. What are their standards? What are the quality of their cattle? Um, what's their reputation? Um, and how are they producing? Are they doing it all on grass? If you go into somebody's operation and they're supplementing everybody in the herd with two pounds of soybean holes a day, um, and you think you're going to take those genetics back to your place and do it on grass, you're rolling the dice. Um, ties right into environment, right? Um, all the old timers, those of you that saw me at the Devon Conference recently and, and uh, Bakewell and Bondsma and, and animals that are suited to their environment. If you take an animal out of the Garden of Eden and put them in the Sahara Desert, and expect it to perform the same, you're, you're, you're fooling yourself. If you don't live near another Devon producers and you're the first one to bring them into your region, you got to roll the dice. I get that, but try to find an environment as similar to yours as you can. Bulls for grass come from herds managed on grass. What are your production goals? Are you producing seed stock? Are you producing stockers? Uh, are you finishing the animals? All these come into play. If I'm selling them at the local market, I want early growth, uh, as much size and weight gain as I can get in a short time. Nothing else matters. Uh, if I'm finishing the animals, I need animals that are going to have high quality meat. I need animals that are going to finish in a short time and efficiently. I need animals that are docile and easily managed. So what your production goals are certainly should match what you're doing. What are the needs of your herd? Exact same thing. What are the size of your herd? Um, all these can factor in. Again, if I'm producing animals to go to a local livestock market, nothing's being kept and I got five cows, I can probably get them bred with, uh, you know, a yearling bull or a one nutted bull or I don't know what, but uh, those of us that are in seed stock production, obviously it becomes more difficult. Breeding soundness exam, we talked about performance versus contemporaries. Um, I know we're going quick here and I'm over, but this one I have to talk about, right? If somebody calls me and says, I just weaned a 700 pound bull calf. Well, whoop de do. You know, if everybody out there in your field weaned at six, 700 pounds, so what? It means you've got high level of nutrition, you got big cows, whatever. But if you weaned 40 calves and the, and the average was 520 pounds, but this one weighed 650 pounds, now you're talking, all right? On the same grass, same mineral, same management system, this animal, these animals outperform their contemporaries. That means a lot more to me than the, the number. Um, you get what you pay for. This goes back to knowing where you are. Um, if you're a guy with five cows, you can't afford to buy a $15,000 bull to cover them. I get it. But if you're a guy with 40 cows, um, in my opinion, sell five cows if you have to. Get the best bull you can get um, to make improvements and move forward. 
EPDs, genomics, ultrasound, linear measurements. There's lots of tools out there for evaluating cattle. Again, I've run over, so we won't get deep into those. All these are great. When I'm evaluating bulls, I want information. The more information, the more weights and data and scans and measurements you can give me, the better. But they're all tools and you have to put the appropriate value. If I'm buying just on an EPD or just on an ultrasound, I'm, I'm, I'm missing out. It's more about balance in the complete package. And finally, it's about meat, right? We're in the business of producing high quality gourmet meat. This is 1967 Devon uh, steak with incredible marbling. Our host tonight, AJ's got these pictures on Facebook right now, if you haven't seen them of, of mouthwatering meat. And I'm a little mad because I ordered a ribeye and couldn't get one, but this is what we're talking about. We have an animal that can convert grass into a, a highly digestible usable protein for human consumption that's the most delicious thing out there and not everybody can do it not everybody has what we have so we're talking about production but don't lose sight of the end game um, we've got cattle that'll last a long time and we've got cattle that are quiet and we've got cattle that will produce high quality meat and those things shouldn't be taken for granted but should be embraced and and those traditions carried on so that's the presentation i don't know aj didn't interrupt me with any questions i know i went really fast hopefully people can refer back to this but uh if there are any questions aj i'd be happy to answer them yeah sounds good we do have one here from enrique um he says, you, you mentioned deficient udders tend to be one of the worst deficiencies um, for cows that aren't called. But he said, what are the most common deficiencies that you see in bulls that, uh, that aren't called and should be? Um, the most common deficiencies in bulls, I would just say is performance. Um, I see far too many people that keep a bull a bull just because they paid a lot of money for mom or because the bull calf was AI'd out of a fancy sire. And um, people that invest a lot of money in an animal tend to hold on to that animal and, and see if it'll work out next year and the year after. Um, that's, I know you were looking for more of a confirmational defect um, but if I, if I had to say that, I, I, it would just be, um, lack of structural correctness in general, right? Because again, with bulls, there's such a slim mer error for margin, um, or margin of error rather that, 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 you know, people hold on to a bull till it's a year old or two and say, yeah, I know this is the issue, but what do you think? Well, you knew it was an issue. Why are, why are we still talking about it a year or two later? With bulls, there should not be significant noticeable issues. Well, if there aren't any other questions, um, thank you all. I hope, I know that was fast. I know we're going to put this up on the internet so people can go back to it. Um, if there are follow-up questions, um, you can certainly email me or AJ or, or, or Becky, anybody in the organization, and they'll get to me, and I'm happy to answer them. Look at lots of pictures and videos from different people every week, um, and uh, happy to help others wherever we can. But again, remind everybody that evaluating pictures is evaluating pictures, um, so you always need to take it with a, with a grain of salt and... Uh, um, and encourage everybody to be observant, right? I've, I've broke down rump slope and shoulder angle and, and a lot of different things, but don't get caught up too much in the components. It's more about the overall balance of the animal um, and eye appeal and tracking and uh, goes a long, long way. Thanks, Jeremy, for your time. I really appreciate that. It's been a, been a great series. Look to uh, you know to move forward. I'd like to get Jerry and 
and Vic back again in the spring um, and continue on with that. I think that was a great one. Uh, it's, I think it had the most attendees too as well. So you could tell the interest was there. Um, with any of the other members, if you want to reach out to me with uh, any topics, um, one of the topics I'm thinking about for the next go around, I, I talked to my one buddy and he's, uh, he's really interested in, in trees and pastures and silvo pasturing and he actually has kind of set out on a uh, on a mission as well as us with beef he's been chasing genetics that will grow straight trees and have long lasting trees so he's been on a mission for that so i'm thinking about bringing him back in the spring as well um and so welcome some other topics i just appreciate everybody being involved and i say we still we want to do this again next year spring and fall and uh and continue the education so just let people know and uh i'm excited for another year steve you want thank to give you. any closing remarks well jeremy thank you for all your work in prep uh of this that was really helpful i can't wait for daylight now so i can go down and reevaluate all these bull calves that i thought were were killer um so thanks for giving us tools to kind of look at and to hang on to um, a great series and I'm excited about continuing to press into what it looks like to improve the Devon breed here in, in North America and excited about uh, working with you guys to do that. So thanks to everybody that participated uh, live and also who uh, paid to uh, help fund this webinar series. That's uh, it's helpful for everything we're trying to do yeah and then for anybody else who's interested in uh you know we're, we are going to post this video again um but for anyone that wants a powerpoint so that way they can uh you know study some of those um sentences some of the slides that jeremy had um probably reach out to becky's going to be the easiest we'll get that over to jeremy get that over to becky and i know becky's she's always so great at field and we just seem to keep piling it on her and she keeps doing it so be grateful for her, but probably reach out to her is going to be the best way to do that, or to, or to Jeremy directly, whichever. Well, thanks again. I would call that a wrap. Thank you, AJ, for all your work with all this series. Yep. Thank you. Good night. We'll see you guys.